I so great, I started to wonder of what is the purpose of life. At a young age, I found there were a lot of inevitable moments of distress in life. At the same time, I didn't believe in the existence of afterlife. Therefore, it seemed to me a quite bad deal to spend a lifetime struggling to achieve any form of success that is going to be nothing the moment you die. If a life of great achievements can be rendered futile by mortality, a common and unremarkable life is considered to be even more worthless by, by the eight-year-old me. What is the significance of human beings if we are just bound to carry out this ancient and naturalistic pattern of life? I was frightened by the thoughts that human beings are just random combination of molecules and atoms driven by this ancient instinct to survive, living, multiplying, and dying in endless succession. My pessimistic view of the nature of human existence changes as I grew up contemplating on this question that has haunted me for years. I eventually came to a conclusion that even though human beings are now born with a definite purpose, this does not prevent us from giving meaning to our life. And I think the meaning of life is to maximize the pleasure we can experience during our lifetime. And today I'm going to present to you my honors capstone project on the purpose of existence, a defense of hedonism. Hedonism derives its name from the Greek word for delight. It is a school of thought that argues that pleasure is the most primary intrinsic good. Intrinsic good, as opposed to instrumental good, means having value in itself. Hedonists strive to maximize the pleasure they can feel in their lifetime. And hedonism can be interpreted into two ways. Psychological or motivational hedonism argues that the ultimate motive for all voluntary human action is the desire to feel pleasure and avoid pain. As opposed to it, as for humanism argues that pleasure is the only thing that has value, and its value is independent of anything it may cause or prevent. And in my presentation, I will provide a defense of a version of ethical humanism. And I will focus on the work of Greek philosopher Epicurus and English philosopher John Stuart Mill. Epicurus is an ancient Greek philosopher as well as the founder of a school of thought called Epicureanism. Epicurus thinks that pleasure has two components. The first is aponia, which means the absence of pain. It is considered as a height of physical pleasure. The second is ataraxia, which means peace and freedom from fear and anxiety. Um, this is considered as a height of mental pleasure. What is worth noticing is that Epicurean humans uh, strive for the absence of pain instead of the pursuit of pleasure. He thinks there is no need for pleasure if there is no pain. And Epicurus thinks that Aponia is achieved through the limitation of our desires, and he differentiates between natural desire versus unnatural desire. Natural desire has a limit and can be easily satisfied, while unnatural desire can never be satisfied and has no limit. For example, hunger, um, a natural desire, can be easily satisfied by a piece of bread. However, if you have unnatural desire for luxurious food, um, it can never be satisfied since there is no limit for luxury. And instead, we will feel anxiety and distress about the possibility of losing our current style of life. So we were devoted all of our energy to preserve our style of life. And therefore, in order to feel pleasure, we need to eliminate our unnatural desire. Epicurus thinks that ataraxia is achieved through the knowledge of the workings of the world and through practicing philosophy. And he identified the source of anxiety that disturbs ataraxia as people's fear of death a god, an afterlife punishment, and this anxiety in turn became to the source of irrational and extreme desires. And in response to people's fear of death and afterlife punishment, Epicurus argues that since soul is necessary for sensation to occur and our soul does not survive the death of our body, there could be no pains or sufferings inflicted on us or regrets about the life lost. And he thinks the nature of death is a state of unconsciousness that we have all been through before we are born to this world. Therefore, there's nothing to fear about that since all the emotions, feelings, and thoughts will just naturally fade away. And in response to people's fear of God, Epicurus responds with the famous Epicurean um, paradox. He argues that since God is omnipotent and God is benevolent, there shouldn't be any evil exists in this world. The only explanation for the existence of evil 
is that the gods do not concern themselves with us. Therefore, there's nothing to fear about the distant and indifferent gods, since they do not seek to punish us in, for what we do in this or any other life. English philosopher John Stuart Mill classified pleasure into higher pleasure and lower pleasure. He defines higher pleasure as intellectual and moral pleasure, while lower pleasure as a physical pleasure. By stating that it is better to be a human being dissatisfied than pig satisfied, better to be Socrates dissatisfied than fool satisfied, Mill indicates there is qualitatively difference between two kinds of pleasure which cannot compensate it by quantity. And in response to people's uh, objections that some people may just naturally um, prefer lower pleasure to higher pleasure, and Mill says that if the fool or the pig are of different opinion, it is because they only knew their own side of the question, which means that people who have experienced both kinds of pleasure will naturally prefer the higher ones to the lower ones. And in my study, I focused on two objections uh, against the humanism. The first is chemical enhancement problem, which raises the question whether pleasure artificially produced can also be considered valuable. Um, the second arises from at, uh, Aristotle's definition of a valuable life. Um, Aristotle thinks that the value lies in the activities, and the pleasure only helps us to engage in worthwhile activities. Therefore, pleasure itself does not have any value. And I will elaborate on these two objections later in my presentation when I produce my response to them. Retaining Mills and Epicurus' classification of pleasure, I classify pleasure into bodily pleasure and intellectual pleasure. Bodily pleasure arises from the gratification of our natural desires, and by natural desires, I mean desires to satisfy basic human physiological needs, such as hunger, thirst, and weariness. It produces pleasure because it alleviates the pains and sufferings due to a lack of food and water and rest, and it alleviates our emotional stress result of our struggle to survive. Um, bodily pleasure does not have any value because we all have this natural instinct to pursue it. Um, in our life, we do not have any choice but to devote it a generous part of, generous part of it to tend out our physical needs. However, even though bodily pleasure is valueless in itself, it acts as a prerequisite for the true enjoyment of intellectual pleasure, since our soul does not survive the, body, the death of our body. It's essential for us to fulfill our physiological needs before we can truly enjoy intellectual pleasure. Different from bodily pleasure, intellectual pleasure arises from the pursuit of knowledge, and um, it is not affected by the result of this pursuit. Intellectual has, pleasure has value because we pursue it only according to the direction of our free will. We do not play a piano because otherwise we will die. We do not read a book because the lack of reading is lethal. We choose to engage in these activities that are not essential to our survival because they please our mind. And by engaging in intellectual activities, we defy our natural instinct to devote all of our life to the sole task of survival, and we liberate us from our natural instinct, um, which only causes fear and anxiety. And based on my re-evaluation of humanism, I will put my response to two objections here. The first is the Nordic um, experience machine. It is a thought experiment put forward by American philosopher Robert Nordic, and it is um, one of the best known attempts to refute humanism. Nordic asks us to imagine this machine that is capable to produce any kinds of pleasurable experience we could ever want, and people are free to choose what kind of pleasure they want to experience. Um, also, those who are hooked up to a machine cannot differentiate between the experience they had uh, on the machine from um, the experience they had in the reality. And Nordic argues that since most people will not choo choose to spend their lifetime on the machine, it means there is this something other than pleasure that is valued by people. And my response to Nordic's objection agree with his assumption. Indeed, a life spent on a machine is not valuable. However, intellectual pleasure is still the only measurement for what is good and evil. The following in Nozick's argument is that the, um, the experience machine changes the property of um, intellectual pleasure it produced. From a spontaneous natural pursuit, it is degraded into a means, a way to satisfy a need, the need to feel self-actualization. 
And even though people have freedom to choose what kind of pleasurable experience they want, um, the machine still limits their choice to a definite number, while in reality, there's infinite number of pleasure we can feel, and it is different according to different person. Therefore, this fundamental difference between the intellectual pleasure arises from a spontaneous pursuit and produced artificially produced. We cannot discuss Aristotle's theory of ethics without discussing about um, the concept of eudaimonia. It is a Greek word for a life of happiness, and Aristotle argues that even though everyone considers eudaimonia as the highest good for human life, we all disagree about what kind of life can be considered as eudaimonia and how we can achieve it. And Aristotle thinks that a life of happiness consists of uh, engaging in virtuous activities according to reason. And pleasure is good, but not the only good. Um, pleasure helps us to engage in virtuous activities. However, it does not have any value in itself. And my response to Aristotle's uh, objection argues that by engaging in intellectual activities, we comprehend the laws governing the universe. And therefore, we prevent our life from being controlled by this uncertainty and randomness in nature. We eliminate the origin of anxiety and fear. And the purpose of intellectual activities is to liberate human beings from the control of any unknown power and let our course of life be solely determined by our own will. Thus, the value of intellectual pleasure actually lies in the pleasure since uh, we aim to achieve, aim to eliminate the origin of anxiety and fear. Conclusion. Um, Retaining Mills and Pure's definition of um, pleasure, I classify pleasure into intellectual pleasure and bodily pleasure. Bodily pleasure arises from gratification of physiological needs, while intellectual pleasure arises from the pursuit of knowledge. However, only intellectual pleasure is valuable because the pursuit of it arises from our free will, as opposed to the pursuit of bodily pleasure, which arises, our, arises from our natural instinct to survive. And the intellectual pleasure should not be produced by any artificial means, since, um, as I talked before, the difference between intellectual pleasure and bodily pleasure is, is that intellectual pleasure arises from our free will. And by artificially producing intellectual pleasure, we reduce it into a form of bodily pleasure, as it is now a way to um, satisfy a need, the need to feel self actualization. And intellectual pleasure should always be the end, not the means. Intellectual activities serve to free us from any external power and makes our life being solely governed by our own free will. And their ultimate purpose is to produce intellectual pleasure. Therefore, the value lies in the pleasure rather than uh, activities, as Aristotle explained. That's my bibliography. And thank you.